certainly going into 2023 with this level of uncertainty, we are going to see misestimation. We're going to see capital flows. We're going to see trends in a number of sectors that make me much more positive about the potential returns and the potential utility of, of an allocation to a liquid alternative, a directionally agnostic, unbiased diversifier than they may have been over the previous 10 years. Imagine spending an hour with the world's greatest traders. Imagine learning from their experiences, their successes, and their failures. Imagine no more. Welcome to Top Traders Unplugged, the place where you can learn from the best hedge fund managers in the world so you can take your manager due diligence or investment career to the next level. Before we begin today's conversation, remember to keep two things in mind. All the discussion we will have about investment performance is about the past, and past performance does not guarantee or even infer anything about future performance. Also understand that there's a significant risk of financial loss with all investment strategies, and you need to request and understand the specific risks from the investment manager about their product before you make investment decisions. Here's your host, veteran hedge fund manager, Niels Kostrup Larsen. Hey everyone and welcome to another edition of Top Traders Unplugged, where today Alan Dunn and I are joined by Marty Luik, Research Director and President of Aspect Capital, as part of our mini-series focusing on the one investment strategy that beat everything else in 2022, namely trend following and managed futures more broadly. First off, Marty, it is great to have you back on the podcast. Thanks so much for joining us today. We have really been looking forward to our conversation and I hope you're doing well. Had maybe some time off over the holidays after what I imagine was a busy year, which also happens to be the 25th anniversary of Aspect Capital, if I'm not remembering incorrectly. Absolutely right. Uh, Niels and Alan, it is a pleasure to be with you both again. I, I hope you're well and uh, happy almost still New Year. Yes, 2022 was a, an exciting year for, for many reasons. And um, I think we as a family, like many other people, in, indulged in a little bit of revenge travel uh, towards the end of the year. So I rounded up my family and we made our first ever trip to New Zealand and um, and had the pleasure of seeing my brother who lives in Australia for the first time in five years. So it was really good all around um, and very happy to be back uh, at my desk for what I'm sure is going to be an equally exciting 2023. Yeah, no, it definitely will be. And we'll dive into quite a few topics as well that we found um, sort of that we thought was would be interesting for the audience to, uh, to uh, listen to. Now, before we do that, I thought maybe we could provide a little bit of, um, you know, a little bit of highlights, uh, backgrounds to, to Aspect. Um, so perhaps you could share that. Uh, as I mentioned, 25 years in the business, that's a great achievement milestone. Uh, of course, you've been in the business for a lot longer than that. Um, but maybe talk a little bit about the strategies you run, but also kind of how the business look uh, as we enter into this new and exciting year. Yeah, um, well, the origins of, of, of Aspect were uh, on the back of um, AHL, which was the first company I started with David Harding and, and Michael Adam. And that business was acquired by Man Group, who did and have done a super job of, of exploiting it. We left to start Aspect because at the time, so... Um, you know, back in uh, the, the late 90s, the strategy wasn't being exploited in institutional investors' portfolios adequately. That was really our, our objective, was to make a uh, trend as a liquid, direct directionally agnostic diversifier, broadly available and understandable to institutional investors because we felt it was an important addition to their portfolios and scroll forward 25 years and i think one more time that has been demonstrated as as being the case liquid directionally agnostic extremely valuable diversifier in investors portfolios and along the way Niels, we've we've had that consistent focus on research on enhancing every component of a systematic investment process um, so that we do our best to think ahead about risk concerns and, and about you know managing our invest 
investors' money in a consistent, thoughtful, risk-managed way. Uh, and we've diversified the business. So we run a range of programs that are complementary to the, the original trend focus with uh, a number of relative value and absolute return programs. Um, and that's broadened our research effort and uh, the, the set of capabilities that we can offer to our investors. So now the business is 130 people, almost all of us based in London. We manage $10 billion at, at the start of 2023. I have, a, I think, a very exciting outlook for the strategy, well, for the range of strategies in what I think we will probably agree is a new paradigm that, that we entered into, that we transitioned to over the course of last year. Yeah, no, absolutely. And of course, um, uh, I love your origin story with uh, your your co-founders of, of AHL. And I, and I still remember when we huddled together when you had a, your 30th anniversary of that founding uh, at Abbey Road Studios a few years ago. I, I The chemistry between the three of you was very beautiful to watch after all those years. And, and we had a great conversation that people, of course, can find in the library of these podcast uh, episodes. That that was that was great, Niels, and I'm I'm very grateful that you you uh, were able to round us up and do it. It was it was a pleasure to be with Michael and David again, and um, and as you say, the chemistry is uh, very similar. All right. Well, we have, uh, as I mentioned, a few different uh, topics that we're going to go through, and we kind of interchange a little bit. So, as usual, Alan, why don't you uh, kick it off with uh, with where we want to start? Sure. Um... Good to see you, Marty. Um, you touched on a few kind of uh, important aspects of aspect, I guess. Uh, <laughs> the research process, you know, systematic trading, liquid markets, um, directionally uh, agnostic. Um, so this kind of all paint a picture of, of the investment philosophy, I guess. When, it, when you go back to, the, you know, back to the, your early days in AHL and uh, starting up the, the, the firm, would you say the investment philosophy has evolved over time or, or your beliefs and what the kind of opportunities that are available in markets? Has that evolved or, or has that been fairly consistent, would you say, over time? Well, I think the way in, the, the, the real origin story of, of, of AHL was more three physicists just pottering around with um, with financial data and distilling some essential features of markets that could be captured and, and, and systematized. I think it's only through the passage of time that that's coalesced into a clearer, what you describe as investment philosophy. You know, as three twenty somethings, I I don't think any of us claim to have an investment philosophy. But what that has evolved into is something really clear and and I hope really useful once again to to our investors. You know, that is the you know the power of broadly diversified trend to be able to capture. I, I, don't want to keep saying it, but the directional agnosticism, we're indifferent to rising and falling markets through the use of, of futures, through the very broad exposure to asset classes that are diversified one from the other. And very much in our case, what became a foundation, a cornerstone of our now investment philosophy is to remain unbiased. Because the tendency is to have, if not a recency bias, you look at the data and you conclude, well, bonds only go up. So I'm going to dial that into the models. That, as we've seen, can be a big mistake. So, uh, you know, the applicant, the disciplined and consistent application of trend with as broad an application as possible, thoughtful risk management and portfolio construction and um, an unbiased approach to capturing those trends. That's a consistent investment philosophy that I think, you know, distilled out of that early origin story and has remained consistent throughout. On top of that, Alan, the research process has looked at every component of 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 that and continued to enhance and expand it over the uh, the arc of twenty five years at Aspect and and uh, many years at at AHL before that. And we always ask, kind of kicking off about the kind of perspective on why these strategies work. I mean, 
you're obviously exploiting opportunities from a trend perspective and, and combining that with, with other strategies with you know greater computing power with with greater information what wh- wh- do you think these um opportunities continue to exist in markets the essence of trend which you know we'll come back to the utility of of trend as a building block in investors portfolio but i think it essentially boils down to behavioral and the ability of investors to digest new information and i think you know personally i think a good analogy to this is how we all responded to the covid pandemic if you just i think you'd agree with me gentlemen that you know that february of 2020 ah, there's some problem off in China, not my problem. And then it sort of gets close to home and you think, crikey, um, this is this is not good. And then, you know, the, the mandate comes down, everyone back home. And do you remember we were all saying, well, we'll be back at work in a couple of weeks. So our ability to digest information is sort of constrained by by the speed of human cognition, not, you know, and all the technology in the world isn't really going to change that. So I've never been a believer in, you know, in the singularity. You don't you don't immediately snap to full fair value uh, around the world. So trend trends develop because they're you know, for a number of reasons. I, I don't want to just single it out, but a lot of this and I think what we've saw very off very much in 2022 and speaks to my expectations for 2023 is persistent uncertainty. So look last year at uh, at the global response, and in particular the Fed's response to inflation prints. It was always yeah transitory, and and it kept coming and it kept coming, and then transitory became maybe not so transitory. And but we were always behind the curve. So it's your inability to predict and always be surprised that creates you know, trading decisions that creates flows and those are the effects that trend capitalizes on so it's a very particular strategy it's a very useful strategy i don't think in if as compared with say arbitrage mispricings it isn't an inefficiency that gets arbed out of the markets it's you know the what managers like Aspect do, and many of the other interesting and talented folks you have uh, on the show, I'm I'm going to make a strong case for the systematic application of, you know, trend measurement and and trading uh, as a result of that. That's the essence. That's the value. That's the consistent and persistent effect that we're able to take advantage of. And it's we're obviously speaking, you know. January 2023, after a great year for trend following. So when we speak about these topics, they're all very easy to understand in our minds. We've got plenty of examples of, you know, speed of uh, digesting new information and, you know, market being slow to kind of get on the inflation narrative and then getting on board. But if we went back to have this conversation, maybe in 2019, um, there was, you know, this question about, well, is that still the case? Does the, do these strategies still work? When you look back at that period, what was it about it? Was it a less uncertain environment or just a less volatile period? Or, or why was it that we had that kind of tough period uh, for, for, for trend following? I think it was a less uncertain period. I think we've had a long arc Somebody described it the other day as the dead hand of the uh, of central banks. You know, you've had a long arc. I want to say almost in the aftermath of the global financial crisis. You know, the the first coordinated quantitative easing and and fiscal, um, you, you know, and and injection of liquidity that became the mo. So we've had, goodness me, you know, a really long run where markets by and large have had a have had a goldilocks period we've had um coordinated uh quantitative easing we've had a a very responsive fed and we've all heard we've had plentiful liquidity which got ridiculous you know in in the aftermath of of covid but we've just had the a framework of reduced uncertainty the fed put 
by the dip. And that's what many, many people have spent their entire investing careers thinking was the norm. And, um, you know, judging by the three of our hair conditions, you know, we've been around for long enough that this, the last 10, 12 years isn't the norm. This, this, that's been the exception. So you, you talk about 2019 and, and, uh, you know, I'd extend that all the way back to sort of 2009. We've had a period where, by and large, the uncertainty and dispersion in in markets and and innate volatility has been suppressed. Yeah, no, I want to stay a little bit about the. Um, I mean, you mentioned Marty the fact that you have obviously different strategies uh, at Aspect, but if we just focus on the trend part, and I don't know uh, specifically whether you just offer trend in in one version, and I don't know whether that is a quote-unquote pure trend or, or more diversified trend. But I wanted to bring it into to kind of a context of a paper that um, Cliff Asnes wrote last year, um, where he kind of, first of, all, first of all, he kind of introduced the idea, or maybe he didn't introduce it, but he certainly brought up the idea of, of us having a, a dual mandate, both to make money in an absolute uh, style, but also make money when, when we have crises, especially uh, equity crises. But then at the same time, we know from that period where trend wasn't uh, necessarily uh, um, as, as profitable as it had been, that people diversified their trend programs with other stuff. And then Cliff, I think, kind of put it in a, a way uh, of saying, well, are we as managers becoming too concerned about the sharp? And, and are we maybe doing um, our clients disservice uh, at some point by putting other stuff into the trend models because one when they really need the trend model, then they might, might not produce the same uh, returns as, as you would expect. So uh, take it as you you, you want and, and kind of talk to us a little bit about your your views on, on these uh, uh, um, topics because I'm sure you, you've come across these points uh, before. Yeah. So the, the first question is, is that Aspect offers trend in a number of different formats from pure traditional market trend through to our our, our flagship which is 80 percent trend and 20 percent modulating strategies to an alternative markets portfolio and more recently a chinese uh, market trend portfolio and we also offer our in investors the opportunity to customize the blends between those and and indeed their their choice of markets should they have particular you know, investing constraints or or ESG considerations as as an example also to provide different access points for volatility choice and liquidity usage so first of all i think what i've expressed in that is that we work with our investors to find the right utility for their portfolios rather than you can have any color you like as long as it's black. We're not just bundling these models into one portfolio and take it or leave it. And the motivation for that is the passionate belief that the trend utility is, you know, all, all the way back to that origin story, is so useful in, in investors' portfolios for all of the attributes that I've already described. And I shared this with a colleague and he thought it was um, uh, interesting. I've always thought of, you know, trend almost as the medicine um, that you are, you know, is good for investors. And all of the diversification around it, non-trend strategies, is, in my view, very much uh, an effort to make the medicine more palatable. Because that utility, that convexity the, that Cliff Asnes is highlighting and that we're all keen to highlight is the real essence of why you want trend as a defensive component in your portfolio. It can be hard to hold. So if it's sharp is just meh, or it is, you know, your trustees are going, what is this? <laughs> you, you know, if you can't hold it in the portfolio, it's not going to be there when you need it. Because when you need it is episodic, it's unpredictable. You you just 
don't know. And the key thing is you just have to have a consistent allocation. You can't time it. You've got to have a consistent allocation in your portfolio. So all the diversifying um, efforts of, of complementary strategies, in my view, are sugar coating to the medicine. And they provide an ability to attenuate some of the rough edges that trend can sometimes have in short periods of sharp reversals or quiescent periods where there are no well-established trends. That's why you might include a carry strategy or a relative value strategy. But you need to be thoughtful about how much of those you combine with your trend, lest you lose the efficacy of the, of the essential medicine. As I hear you speak, it kind of reminds me of when my kids were small and they introduced you could have wine gums with your vitamins, uh, or I should say maybe you have vitamins as a wine gum, and it kind of sounds a little bit uh, like that. So I'm curious to uh, I'm curious to know which one is most popular actually. So these different v versions or, or, or types of trends, can you say anything about what people prefer? Because it's an interesting concept of offering trend in kind of four or five different packages well it's it's very much to taste and that speaks to you to you know, our approach as a business as i say rather than a one size fits all um because we have a very diverse group of investors both geographically because the you know different Jurisdictions have different appetites for fees, for liquidities, for the sophistication of the investors. So, um, it, you know, at one level, if you look at the arc of, of aspect, what began as a aspect diversified began as a pure trend offering, and then it became clear that some of the volatility that trend was delivering in the early 2000s was just unpalatable for investors that weren't, you know, battle hardened trend uh, aficionados. So we began to introduce the modulating, as we call it, the modulating complementary component of, of, of the portfolio. And that was the focus of the business for a very long time. It then became clear that as investors became increasingly sophisticated and understood the merits of the strategy, they wanted, to, to Cliff Asness's point, they wanted the uncut version. We can handle it, Niels. And and that's fine. We're prepared to work with them on that. And and then to the other offerings, because they are distinct. You know, a China offering has its own liquidity and 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 investor uh, features. Uh, our alternative markets offering has different capacity and and diversification features. That's why we embody them in different products rather than lumping everything together. So we can have a conversation with clients to understand their utility and make sure that we're addressing it correctly. Yeah, no, uh, very interesting. Alan, do you want to dive into uh, one of your favorite topics? Yeah, well, actually, I, I, I just wanted to move on because we're talking about the utility of, of, of the different options and it maybe naturally follows to, to think about the role of these strategies within in the context of a multi-asset portfolio, you know, and, and Marty's talking about customization and, and is there, you know, one of the things that has come up in, 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 in the discussion around customization is if you're going to use trend following alongside, say, equities, well, then maybe you might think about capping the equity beta or capping your equity exposure. Is that a good idea or, or is there a limit to how much kind of customization you should do when you, when you start, uh, I guess, meddling with the system in the context of the overall portfolio? I think it, it's a good idea to a point. And with all assets and, and equities included, the risk management of the portfolio makes sure that we don't let exposures get too much concentration in particular sectors. So the portfolio will already limit the amount of, of equity beta or energy beta or, you know, any... Uh, exposure gets constrained any any investor of a of an appropriate size we can have those discussions with alan but i think you get to a point where you know one investor's choice of a beta cap is going to be different from another investor's so i think we have to do our best to have a portfolio that satisfies all of the, all of those needs yeah and in terms of you know the the idea of the diversified versus the pure trend um you know, I 100% agree with what you're saying about the digestibility and taking the medicine. If, you know, in an ideal world, people were very risk neutral and able to to suffer drawdown, 
would 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 the pure trend um, approach be better in the context of a multi asset portfolio if it was going to be used alongside equities, or you know obviously with the diversified multi strat you get the diversification so presumably you can lever up the components of it as well so there's that angle to it as well so what, what what's your thoughts on that again with with the caveat of depends on the investor I think the idea of introducing those modulating strategies I, I talked about cutting off the or, or uh, attenuating in the rough edges I think it's also to add some returns in periods where trend may not be returning so the overall effort is to improve the the sharp the um the expected returns just to reiterate and I'm, I'm going somewhere with this you know the defensive role as part of a diversified portfolio you know you investors look to trend to provide risk mitigation and more recently that's been interpreted as equity risk mitigation but i think it it does have broader application but that equity risk mitigation nobody's under the illusion that it's a hedge it's you know if i have a down day in the s p i don't expect necessarily to have an up day in my trend portfolio but if i have a down quarter or a down six months in equities, I can reasonably expect that my trend will provide certainly positive returns from from those sectors. You know, that's its key role. But you know, so compare that with uh let's say you're you're buying puts. Well they're once in a blue moon, they're going to be extremely useful and you'll be glad you had them, but it takes nerves of steel and and deep pockets to be able to keep paying the premium to have that in your portfolio. One of the beauties of trend is that its expected returns over time are positive. There isn't a negative carrying cost to provide you that um, episodic convexity, that risk mitigation, and the diverse. You know, adding a component of complementary diversifying positive sharp strategies is going to raise that so it is an effort to make the the carrying cost of the of the medicine uh, that much better and i'll just take that one step further which is that you know we're we're probably all aware of the consultant led initiative of of introducing you know crisis risk offset or risk mitigation portfolios where that's a you know, a thoughtful portfolio construction approach to the diversifying, the defensive strategies that investors should have to complement their traditional assets. And personally, I love it because it's, you know, that is, um, that's an extension of the, of the medicine, you know, bless them because they're making a case because really, and of course, I center on what's the core, what's the core of that approach? It's the trend, it's the medicine at the heart of it. And everything else, whether it's your first responder or your absolute return components, you know, those make the whole unit more palatable. So if you can sell that as a line item to the trustees that they just keep it and don't touch it, that allows the medicine to do its work uh, when it needs to. So. That's a very long-winded answer, Alan, but I think the choice, but you know, I'm not saying my diversified fund, you have to buy that one. I think it depends on the sophistication of the investor and what else they have in their portfolio. If they've done the thinking and they've got their first responder strategies and their absolute return components and they think that plays nicely, then buy our pure trend. If they don't have those other components, then the modulating strategies introduce an element of those components that is complementary to the essential medicine that we're uh, that we focused on. Makes sense. Um, yeah, we we kind of jumped ahead there in terms of our normal uh, uh, list of questions. But so backtracking, I mean, it's all related to, to this. But I mean, you touched on how you started off in in the eighties, kind of looking at applying data to, to to markets and trying to figure out what what might work. So you've been effectively running a research process for 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 a number of decades now, um, and and that's obviously on the trend and the non trend side. So I mean, what, what would you say have been the the, the things that that you've learned, or, or, or what what have, what has come out of that in terms of enhancing? The, the quality of the systems over time. Um, I guess one thing we hear is is applying it on more markets. If you were to apply the, the, those old systems now, do you think they'd, they'd be very much underperforming uh, the, the kind of the, the better, more enhanced versions that you you run now? 
you know, at a high level, the behavioral response of of the human, of the Homo sapiens sapiens, hasn't evolved over certainly the arc that I've been doing this. And we've all seen these various studies of 100 years of trend, 200 years of trend, 800 years of trend. You know, so the essential concept or the, or the behaviors that we are seeking to capture in a systematic and thoughtfully risk managed process, those remain consistent. But goodness me, the world has has evolved uh, over over 40 years. So yes, you speak to the breadth of markets that we have um, access to, and that's hugely valuable to our investors, the diversification. And, and, and I just side side note what's really interesting is that the portfolio that we first traded let let's go all the way back to um you know 1987 or 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 89 there there was a six market portfolio a 17 market portfolio a 33 market portfolio and in the day they afforded a, a fair degree of diversification if you just to your question if you just traded that portfolio my expectation is it would be less performant not not because the market you know have markets become more efficient in one sense yes is there are those markets in themselves less likely to trend no but what has happened over time is that we've had this sort of you know globalization so that same 33 market portfolio is going to offer less inherent intrinsic diversification now than it did in the 1980s. So the addition of new markets, new diverse source, independent sources of, of potential return and potential trending behavior, that's been a consistent theme through the arc of, of, of all of my career. And, you know, we're trading, gosh, 300 plus close to 400 markets across the trend suite uh, aspect diversified and our core pure trend program trade just shy of 200 markets um and and i'm sure there will be more being added you know over the over the course of this year and next and the one after um so market diversification i think how we execute the markets because you know think think back to eddie murphy and trading places that was um you know that was how we and and the early days of getting into the pits you we would literally go to chicago and try and identify who the biggest baddest floor brokers were so and hire them so that they could get your orders done first the world is very different now fortunately and uh you know, and it and it's electronic, and our whole execution methodology has evolved. That rather than trying to hit the market as aggressively as as your linebacker and uh, can possibly do it and get the trades done, we want to smooth those trades and those signals out over time, and and you know, the make no leave no trace of of where we've been uh, in the markets. We want to feed it in really gently, and then finally. You know, I do get the question when I meet investors, you know, and they say, goodness me, you've been doing this a long time. Surely you've figured out trend following by now. Um, and I say, no, nope, there's always something new to learn. There's always, you know, and I don't mean that we're forever retuning the models and saying, hmm, metals going faster last year. That was a good idea. Let's tweak. It's not that at all. And in fact, you know, being, you know, the recency bias, adjusting your models to what worked last year is is a recipe for uh for disappointment both for yourself as a manager and 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 for your investors um but having said that you know both our investors utility what they want from their trend following evolves over time and also you know some of the the responsiveness dynamics of markets. So we we continue to refine. We continue to um, look for you know new features and and enhancements and evolution. I'm I'm being a bit opaque, but we're really excited about some of the the enhancements um, that we've made to trend after all this time. Still, the team finds new stuff, and I. I go, wow, didn't think of that 25 years ago. That, that's why they're driving um, and I'm, um, I'm hanging on. And one of the other topics and issues that has come up a little bit with talking to other managers is, you know, obviously there's a general belief in, in 
the merit of systematic uh, strategies and 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 you know the, if you have a systematic process it takes away the emotion but but for but there's a lot of discretion involved in in running all of these uh, the research processes and choosing markets to trade and when to take out uh, models etc uh, to what extent d- does that come into your process and particularly you mentioned how it seems now that we may be in the midst of a regime shift and you know that period of the last 10 years or at least the 10 years since say 2019 was very different would you take would that feed into the research process in 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 a way would you kind of make a discretionary insight that you know we maybe we need to be looking in in a certain direction based on your observation of of how the world is changing alan no uh, you know i think i think what history has taught me certainly of, of running these strategies is my ability to predict where opportunities are going to present themselves is weak to negative and um and you know when people say where do what do you think about gold you know you don't you know what i think is irrelevant so uh, the value of this is in it being as agnostic and as broadly diversified as it is so we make no predictions we remind investors of you know just you know you think about the start of 2023 and you know there's starting to be a bit more a bit more buoyancy well maybe inflation has peaked you know china's coming out it's all it's all rosy guys so let's let's get back into 64 doesn't mean that i have any more insight than anyone else but i would just remind you know again it's human nature to sort of grasp at the good news and so we're all seeing you know flowers in the fields um there's still storm clouds on the horizon in many many different directions um so that's a, a again alan no we make no discretionary uh, adjustments to to the shape of the portfolio but you're right in terms of what we research which sectors we you know new markets that we think are are um we get our skates on and 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 include in in the portfolio what areas of the, of the program we are not satisfied with and we need to to refocus on those are discretionary decisions that will be influenced by conversations you've had with clients um your relative and your absolute performance y- yes but that's much more of a you know, agenda setting and 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 where you focus your sure. your resources. Niels, did you want to come in on research? Yeah, no, uh, yeah, exactly. I, I, before I jump to the next topic, I do want to just stay on this uh, the, the kind of the research evolution uh, a little bit. You know, uh, without it being a big secret, I think it's fair to say that trend following as as was done maybe thirty years ago, today parameter picks are probably more long term uh, in nature. Uh, compared to uh, back then. And first, I just wanted to uh, ask whether you uh, kind of uh, agree with that, that, you know, models have become uh, longer term. But then also, why you think that might be? Is that a function of uh, more AUM we have to manage, so we have to kind of slow things down a bit? Is it because markets have somehow changed? Or why is it that, uh, you know, models have become a little bit more long term, do you think? I'm I'm hesitating to to agree with that assertion. Maybe I'm losing my long-term memory, but I I think we've you know we have retained a very consistent approach to you know the timescales of our models and 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 again that just speaks to the arc of of this that you'll get periods where it looks like your you know markets are speeding up and if you lean into faster trend that's the thing to do and then you'll have periods where it pays to be you know a little less jumpy and you think oh let's turn all the dials back back down doesn't help you so you know, many, many times over over that long arc, we come back to that question: Is there information? Can I either? Should I be speeding up over time? Should I be slowing down over time? Should I be modifying my settings as a result of recent performance? And we come back to the conclusion that that that's there's 
no value. Well, there's limited value. There's more. There's more value in the simul. Your simulations will look better, Niels, but I think the outturn performance not necessarily. So no, that, that's. I mean, that's that's good to hear in 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 a sense. And actually, I I kind of agree with you when I look at uh, some of the the stuff that that uh, I have access to in terms of looking at. Uh, what the quote unquote best look back periods have been uh, on a year by year basis and and just seeing that actually they tend to gravitate towards the same kind of cloud range of of choices. But on the other hand, when I speak to uh, people, our colleagues in the industry, I, I do get the impression that they have become a little bit longer term than from when they started. But it, it doesn't mean that everyone has had that experience and clearly you have not. So I want to I want to jump to another point, and that is something that became, again, it's not new, it's been around for a while, but maybe it took a little bit of a change a few years ago, which became evident uh, in 2022, and that's CTA replication. Because last year, probably um, the the funds that took in the most net AUM was not necessarily the managers themselves. It was uh, one or two replicators where essentially they look at the index of managers, the, the index of managers we are actually speaking to in this series, um, and they essentially try and 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 replicate the the exposure by only looking at daily performance. They have no idea what the managers do; they just look at the daily performance. So I'm curious to know how it feels to be replicated, but but also whether you believe that replication works in the long run, and you know. It can work in the short term um, for sure, um, but if it works in the long run as well, doing it this way with some kind of regression, um, but also um, if there are any risks or concerns that you might have uh, when it comes to uh, replication uh, of, of, of our industry. It's a successful strategy and it's a very useful strategy and we don't have a monopoly on it and that's fine. I think that... You know, we're all used to seeing significant dispersion in in our industry. So I, you know, the idea of a trend index is still elu- elusive, and people will try and replicate this. If it if it isn't the fund uh, or the or the folks you're referring to, it's the banks uh, trying to offer you know simplistic trend strategies. Because I, you know, I can I can describe the strategy to my dog. Um, maybe he can't go out and replicate it, but it's conceptually straightforward. But goodness me, I think we'll agree that the devil is in the detail. So, uh, you know, I'm not going to tell you that replication is a bad idea, but it's got it's got risks associated with it that are different than the risks you're taking w- with choosing an individual manager or a small portfolio of managers that you understand well and that you feel complement one another um so if you if you know if you think about it the point is if you are just regressing a basket of managers i guess they're relying on fuzzy central limit theory that all all of the noise that each manager demonstrates is is all going to you know there'll be a um, a common carrier wave that they can capture through their regressions and and more power to them but i think they miss the fact that all of us manage you know i think all credible managers these days and you you know more managers than I do. Is this a true assertion? Have a research process. They continue to evolve. I mean, the days of I, I wrote I wrote it on the back of a fag packet, and that's all we do. Um, I don't think there are many of those managers left. So everyone that is represented in the in the index you refer to that is being regressed and replicated in this case is going to be evolving the regressions are not going to hold um for or they're they're certainly going to going to change over time and what the error term is will be interesting yeah no i completely agree marty of course and it's interesting actually because as as you said earlier we're all still students of trend following even though we've been doing it for a long time and i will say that even to this day i am i do get surprised in the sense that uh, when people talk about trend following, even when we talk about trend following, we kind of talk about just a very limited 
um, part of what we do kind of in terms of the trend models, the signal generation, maybe the risk management, etc. But we don't necessarily talk about, okay, so what do we do with the data before we put it into the engine and, and all of these small things that that also takes place. And you're absolutely right, the devil is in the detail, but it is an interesting space. And one thing I will say, and which I have been on record uh, saying before, and that is if there's one thing I do agree with in terms of replication and that is if it means that more people will get it in their portfolio because they think it's either easier or it's they think it's cheaper uh, or whatever it is if it, or maybe it's packaged in a in a in a, in a ETF uh, that makes it easier for for some investors to put in then that's all good for everyone because all portfolios need trend as uh, as as Alex wrote uh, that uh, famous paper a few years ago when he was at ISAM, and so uh, yeah, I think that uh, that that's my takeaway from from this. I, I I'd agree. I'd agree. It nails the, the I you know the whole uh, whole idea of of aspect was to democratize you know and and encourage the addition of trend into people's portfolios. So uh, I'll I'll agree with your. Your view, if it just makes people more comfortable, let's just not get carried away, though, because people that understand what they're doing, the risks that have constructed this and evolved this over many times, you know, there's a propensity to make the same mistakes <laughs> over and over again uh, in in trend in in replicating strategies. So, I, I agree with your your thesis. I think people should be, uh, you know, caveat emptor. Exactly, and I, and and I'm relying on them not screwing up our industry by <laughs> missing something uh, in their regression uh, analysis. That's for sure. All right, Alan, uh, let's hear what you have uh, coming up. Yeah, well, there was one topic that we didn't get into in the whole research, but that I'm very curious to hear what Marty has to say. And that's we were talking about. You know, it's difficult to fine tune the models. It, it doesn't. You know, it, if you if you're responding to what worked last year, inevitably that's not going to be good. But there is a an approach which is something similar to that, you know, and in in, that's machine learning, that, that, that the machine is trying to learn based on the environment about what's the best way to, to run the models. I'm curious to, to hear what, what what's your perspective on machine learning? You know, going back a few years, it was put forward as a panacea to all of the challenges in running kind of uh, systematic strategies. So what are your thoughts? It's, it's wonderful advances in, um, in, in the space. Here's an interesting anecdote is, you know, in that period you referred to, Alan, where it was getting, you know, super press and was being projected as, you know, the, the panacea to all and the, you know, soon the singularity would be upon us and all of the systematic investment managers could just go home, you know, and, and there was pressure and, you know, what do we know? You know, I, we had many people in the research team that had done their degrees, had done a, a you know a lot of experience of machine learning approaches, and it kind of people's enthusiasm for this was inverse to to how much they knew about it. So the more sophisticated, the more academic people were, they're going, yeah, it's great technology, but for this kind of a problem, let's not get over our skis. So. So absolutely, we invest in that space and, and we think it holds much potential, but we're very careful about how we step into it. And and that goes back to the origins of the business again, that, uh, again, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to pull a lot of threads together. Niels, we're, we're all agreed that what's really important is having trend in investors' portfolios. And the way at the outset of aspect we believed that if you if you as, prior to aspect the approach had been sold as a black box this stuff is great don't ask me how it works just trust us and you have it in your portfolio and it's really useful we thought institutional investors would never going to buy into that kind of a sales pitch we can come back to the irony of that in a minute. Um, but, um, you know, the whole point was you needed to make it transparent. How does this work? Why does this work? When will it work? When will it not work? And that has been the common theme of all our approach to research. What's the underlying hypothesis that uh, we're trying to capture here? How can I validate that? How can I invalidate it? So I'm very cautious, doesn't mean Luddite, but very cautious about throwing data at machine learning. I, we're very keen as we evolve these models and you look at sort of cross-market, non-linear effects that you m might not capture in a 
typical regression, you know, there's potentially value there, potentially significant value there. But we always want to understand the intermediate layers. What is the model? What What is the hypothesis that the machine is capturing? So, sorry, all of these are long-winded answers to, to great questions. It's a really valuable additional tool in the quants arsenal, but use it, use it with caution, use it where it's appropriate. Just uh, moving into the area of risk management and you know, rather than talking about the approach to risk management, I suppose one thing I'm curious about is, you know, what are the risks? I mean, the, the, the obvious risk with trend following is that the markets doesn't trend and we have choppy markets like we've had. But outside of that, I mean, what are the big risks you worry about? And within that, you know, is liquidity a concern? You hear that from time to time. You know, we saw very extreme moves in the UK gilt markets recently on the back of the pension issue. We've had issues with the uh, treasury market uh, going back a couple of years. Um, is that uh, one of the top of the list? Or oh, and, and also we had then the issue around the LME um, last year with the nickel trading. So presumably those types of scenarios, anything else that, that, that you worry about from a risk management perspective that's specific to um, executing a trend system? Um, I, I think you've, you've, gone straight for the key things that w probably don't keep me up at night, but are the, the most concerning issues, access to markets, lack of, uh, you know, free and fair price discovery, though, though maintaining that has to be essential to uh, the ability of, of, of the program to, um, to do what it needs to do. I, actually, I'd sort of, uh, sort of turn it around. I think one of the one of the risks that was creeping into the portfolio through the era that arguably we've just transitioned out of was an artificially low volatility environment that could lure you into a false sense of uh, equity, equity vol less than 10%. You know, therefore, to obtain the risk that my models want, I need a near infinite position to uh, to manifest that risk. That's you know that was uncomfortable. So managing volatility continues to be something we're very aware of and and sensitive to. I do think in this environment, as volatility returns to markets, things are being a bit more right sized. I'm just curious when 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 you mentioned this thing about we want markets to be free and fair. What happened recently in the uh, European gas markets where they're introducing this cap? Is that enough for you to say ah? Now we're into some kind of manipulation. I mean, I know central banks manipulate, right? They can do it with interest rates, and we've kind of gotten used to that and say yeah, okay, we still we still trade them. But what about something like? Uh, European gas is is that enough manipulated to 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 not trade it or how do you think about that? Uh, in, in our view, it I, I mean this is going to be to uh, different managers will respond to this differently. You know, I know some of our peers are, are you know have completely withdrawn from the LME after the shenanigans with uh, with nickel. Um, you know uh, how you trade. The yen or Japanese government bonds with the concerted yield curve control period. That's that's something that we've spent a lot of time thinking about. The example you give is not yet of of a scale where we have adjusted our um, our allocation to to European natural gas. I have a point here, and, and maybe I don't want to go into all of them, but it's kind of combining capacity fees, uh, flows in one. But I'd like to maybe ask you a little bit about fees, because this industry got really knocked down in terms of fees. And I think potentially, actually, I think maybe from memory that you also lowered your fees in your trend offering uh, to some extent. But but how do you think about fees looking forward, perhaps? I mean, have we reached a, a low in what fees might be? Could we even see fees go back up again? Because it's not an infinite uh, capacity strategy, even though there is a lot of capacity, especially if other pension, you know, if the big pension plans, other than the few who have embraced it, um, came on board. How do you, How do you see all of that? Obviously, it's important to having a sustainable business and being able to support a 
consistent research effort and everything we do at Aspect is focused on on delivering consistent, persistent, diversifying returns to our investors. But I don't dwell on the fees. So I think this will continue to be a conversation with clients and the right fee levels for one pension fund are going to be different from, you know, from an, another pension fund because of their utility, because of the uh, the profile of, of investments that they can fit in their portfolio. So back to the common thread through this whole conversation is we're the essential thing is to have trend in the portfolio. That's you know, and we want we want to make that we want to make that possible. You know, and there are countervailing forces. There is there is a lot of capacity in this space, but as you say, it's not infinite. There has been weaker performance over the past decade. Investors reasonably concluded, "Meh, why should I pay for something?" This, I think, we will be revisiting that conclusion. The you know, and there was even the. The, oh, is this, is this alpha? No, no. You know, we came up with a new beta. Drink. Yes, it's alpha. It's really it's timed exposure to markets. It's alpha, and it's val very valuable. I think investors can get this stuff at ridiculously low <laughs> fees, and that's okay. That's good because it's so valuable in in their portfolios. You know, I don't know which way it's going to go. I think I think we've had enough fee pressure for long enough that surely this is a more than reasonable place. And I think there should be an increasing community of investors looking at this and having this in their portfolio, having seen once again, the, the validity. It's not going to necessarily make you positive returns every month, every quarter, every year even, but it's it's invaluable over an investment horizon of, of of three to five years, and there's a price associated with that. Yeah, no, absolutely. Well said. Um, Alan, do you want to dive into a few more things before I wrap up? Yeah, I mean, well, maybe just on that topic in terms of kind of, you know, you're talking about the utility for investors and, you know, having that conversation with different types of clients how do you guide them or help them think about expected returns from the various strategies and say trend in particular? Um, you know, is it just a matter of saying, well, this is what it's done historically, so that's a reasonable benchmark? Or is there, you know, obviously there's the interest rate component, which is, is you know, a, an element to it as well. But how do you help investors, uh, you know, think about what, what they can reasonably expect uh, as they uh, build portfolios? Um, I, I Alan, you've been doing this a, a long time. You know the expectation setting is hugely valuable, and and bringing people into our family of of people that that trust and rely on an appropriately sized allocation to trend is is so important. So so setting expectations, yes, uh, you know the first thing is is to highlight that. Um, you know what we spend a lot of time doing with investors is is setting expectations for what to expect for the volatility of the program that's the key thing to anchor and you know typically trend the starting place for trend portfolios is to replicate the volatility of equities that's where we all began in in developing these portfolios many many years ago on the premise that investors can <clears throat> if you can tolerate equity volatility you can tolerate this the intriguing feature is that it's a very different return distribution profile and behavioral. There's another thread we could go into um, is about the behavioral differences of holding. Trend is much harder to hold behaviorally than equity. So once once a, an investor understands the volatility that this will demonstrate in their portfolio, then the returns are established by historic precedent with the understanding that it's not within my cairn to know what it's going to be for the for the coming year but my expectation is that they're you know in a certainly going into 2023 with this level of uncertainty we are going to see misestimation we're going to see capital flows we're going to see trends in a number of sectors that make me much more positive about the 
potential returns and the potential utility of of an allocation to a liquid alternative, a directionally agnostic, unbiased diversifier um, than they may have been um, o- over the previous 10 years. I mean, you mentioned that that, that point that going back a few years, there was this mention of trend beta versus alpha and is this... Um, but there is simple versus more sophisticated, I guess. Um, how much? How much do you think, uh, like a really good trend follower, can add in terms of research, execution, trading lots of markets, over 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 the simple system? Is is it? I know impossible to put a number on it, but would you say you can be twenty twenty five percent better, or, or just top of your head? What would you say around that? I'm not going to put a number on it, but look at the dispersion in our industry month month to month between, uh, you know, the all the top managers by, you know, reputation assets, the dispersion that can be delivered there. And that that what speaks to the difference between a simplistic, the potential difference between a simplistic implementation and uh, and and a sophisticated. Yeah, no, I just wanted to maybe um, wrap up with with uh, two questions, uh, actually. The, 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 the first one is kind of a, a little bit of an odd one, um, because I'd love to hear what's the one thing you hear about trend following that you disagree with the most? I'm sure you've come across a few things uh, that you disagree with, but is there like one thing that you that every time you hear that being raised, you said, oh, do I really have to <laughs> answer that? Probably it's that assertion or, or the belief that these models have been arbed out, that trend trend no longer works. You know, when you come off the back of a, of a difficult period and people conclude, and I understand why they would conclude that, especially if your frame of reference is, you know, um, multi-manager, high rotation, black box models where the opportunity may, uh, may be, you know, my sat, my information advantage may dissipate or my mispricing may disappear. You could reasonably conclude that the models have lost their efficacy. That's not the case with trend. It is a, you know, yes, there are better implementations than others, but in my belief, it it's the underlying opportunity set that is going to drive the, the quality of returns. So that's probably the uh, here we go again question. Yeah, no, um, certainly uh, would agree with that. Um, the final thing is just, Marty, if there's anything you uh, want to bring up uh, before we, we wrap up completely, anything we may have missed, something that's important for you to to highlight that we uh, that we didn't cover so far, is there anything you want to end with? Well, gosh, you, you started this uh, kindly r- reminding the listeners that this – uh, last year we celebrated 25 years at Aspect, and um, you know, and I'm I'm very proud of that, and I'm still doing it because because we love what we do. We love delivering high quality, diversifying. I won't do the the same. I feel like one of the ends of those ads where the, the medicine ads where it tells you what you know. They speak very very quickly. You know, the very high quality diversifying returns to our investors. 2020. To, you know, after a decent period where people were questioning whether they actually needed it in their portfolio, why do I, you know, I'll call you when I need a diversifier, Marty. At the moment, I'm very happy with my Tesla and my private equity and my Bitcoin, you know, oh my goodness me. You know, so it is very nice to have investors reminded of of the utility of the approach of the value of of, of research um so i don't know whether i've got a full 25 another 25 years but i'm certainly delighted to, to you know to keep going and keep scratching and keep working with the the really talented group of people uh, that we have in, in aspect um and i think the sort of the focus on Investors focused on the quality of their returns and and the firms the, you know that um, that they do business with plays to our strengths. You know that we're we're very proud to have been doing this for twenty five years and um, delighted to continue working with with some of the world's leading investors. It's a privilege. It's a great it's a great industry. It's a great industry. 
it is fantastic industry, and and many people uh, ask me uh, actually if I wanted to change my own career if if I had a choice, and I actually always answer them no. I certainly wouldn't want to do anything else. So, uh, so I completely concur uh, uh, those sentiments, and I do hope actually that we all have another twenty five years in us, um, but uh, but only time will tell. Uh, on this note, we're going to wrap up our conversation. This was fascinating as always, uh, Marty. Thank you so much for being on the podcast, sharing your thoughts and your insights. And of course, we hope that we can do this sometime again in the future. And to all of you listening today, I hope you were able to take something away from today's conversation onto your own investment journey. And if you did, please share these episodes with your friends and colleagues. From Alan and me, thanks so much for listening. We look forward to being back with you on the next episode of Top Traders Unplugged as we continue our deep dive into the CTA industry. And in the meantime, go check out the show notes for this episode and all the resources that you can find on the website. And of course, not least, take care of yourself and take care of each other. Thanks for listening to Top Traders Unplugged. If you feel you learned something of value from today's episode, the best way to stay updated is to go on over to iTunes and subscribe to the show so that you'll be sure to get all the new episodes as they're released. We have some amazing guests lined up for you. And to ensure our show continues to grow, please leave us an honest rating and review in iTunes. It only takes a minute and it's the best way to show us you love the podcast. We'll see you next time on Top Traders Unplugged.